Thank you for attending. So today, I'm, I'm Adam Fournier. I'm from Pivotal, Canada. I run our platform architects for Canada. And today we have a group here from uh, Manulife, and in particular from their lab of forward thinking. So this is the innovation group within Manulife. And our panelists today are Aisha, Michael, and Peter. So we have a set, a set of questions that uh, they're going to answer, then we'll open it up for general conversation. <coughs> but to help set up um, the conversations, who here, we just want to get these, uh, the team here, uh, understanding who's in the, in the audience. So who here is a developer? Uh, who's an operator? More of operations. Okay, business type scenario. What other, what other, I guess, classification, how would you classify yourself? Technical project lead, okay, cool. Any other roles that would be of interest? Yeah? Architect. Architect, excellent. Perfect. Okay, so we're gonna make this very uh, easy. So what we'll do is like a series of like eight or nine questions. We'll just ask them, they'll answer it, and then we'll worry for any further clarification later on. If, if you have a really pressing question you wanna ask, Raise your hand and we'll, we'll try to get you to answer it before we want the next question. Okay? So the first question we have is for Aisha. Um, Aisha, you want to introduce yourself? Absolutely. So, uh, oops, sorry. I'm a product manager at Manulife, or, or a senior innovation fellow within the Loft department. Okay. And we'll go with Michael. Is uh, I'm Michael. Um, I'm a tech lead with Manulife, um, temporarily on loan in the lab of forward thinking. And my name is Peter Tromiak, um, platform engineer, uh, basically on the operations side. Perfect. So now you have a basis of what we got a nice variety here PMs to operator. Uh, so the first question we have is for Asia. Um, Manulife slash John Hancock is a 125 year old insurance with global reach. Um, so, can you please tell us a little bit about your organization? Absolutely. How many people here in the room actually know about Manulife? Okay, 50-50. Uh, so, Manulife is, uh, is a Canadian-based company. Uh, it is about a 125-year-old company, but it's actually not just an insurance company. It, it does more than insurance. Uh, it has launched a lot of products that operate in niche markets for local businesses as well. Uh, one of the things that uh, that comes to mind when you hear about something that's 125 years old is that, oh wait, this company really lacks in IT, which is no longer the case. It was probably true six, eight years back, but we, we spend about over a billion dollars in IT, right? Uh, which also means that it is bigger than a lot of other software companies that spend on IT. Uh, and we are trying to use that as our differentiator uh, to get ahead of the competition. One of the things that Manulife did, as Adam mentioned, we all belong to uh, Lab of Forward Thinking. That's our innovation wing of, of Manulife, where we are trying to play around with technologies like uh, blockchain and cognitive analytics to, to come up with next generation of products to get us ahead of the game. All right, thank you. So the next question is for Peter. Um, could you describe for us the environment where Pivotal Cloud Foundry, Foundry is operating? Definitely. Uh, so we're running Pivotal Cloud Foundry in Azure, um, the, the public cloud version of it. Uh, we have two foundations currently running, one serving uh, sort of dev and test, another serving UAT and prod. Um, they're both running out of US East right now uh, with plans to stand up more foundations in other geographic regions such as Hong Kong, Canada East, Canada Central. Um, for multiple reasons, we are uh, a, a division and a company with global reach. Um, so, uh, and at the same time, we're bounded by certain regulations, data regulations, and, and so on and so forth. So, um, that's sort of the, the next step in our, in our evolution. Um, what's interesting is we actually use our US, the US West region of Azure for DR. Um, about a month or so back, we ran like a DR test and we were able to completely fail over and stand up um, the as the basically what we had running in US East in US West within an hour and a half to two hours um, and everything was in sync everything from the foundation to to the services that are offered um, through the through our production foundation cool. and then and then from your perspective 
Uh, what was, can you talk about how it was like setting up and managing Cloud Foundry? Sure. So uh, as we all know, with a typical client server type project or platform, um, first you have to provision your, your either your physical servers, or your virtual servers. You install the OS, the middleware, various supporting components. And with an enterprise uh, dealing with an external IT vendor, that can take months. Um, so that just slows down development and, and, and uh, delivering value to our end customer. Um, with uh, Bosch and the power of the cloud and Pivotal Cloud Foundry, um, it was basically just a matter of weeks of uh, tweaking and, and building our, our manifest for PCF and the various services, um, running Bosch Deploy, and all those components were, were up and running. Everything from you know, the database, database piece to the, to the app Diego piece. So all those layers, in a matter of hours, we had it up and running. Thank you. So then one final question for you is, uh, obviously, Pivotal Cloud Foundry environment is quite different than traditional infrastructure services. And obviously, there must be a few challenges. I am Pivotal, I'm not uh, ignoring the fact that everything's perfect. Uh, so can you share some of the, these challenges and the things you've learned while going through this process? Yeah, so as you, as those, some of you may not be aware, um, for uh, Azure, Ops Manager does not exist, um, so we had to leverage Bosch. Um, that was a huge learning curve for myself and, and uh, some of the other people on my team. Um, we've never dealt with Bosch. I never heard of Bosch prior to Pivotal Cloud Foundry. Um, but I'm glad that actually happened. Um, Bosch is a very powerful tool, as you probably all are, or some of you are aware. Um, and uh, going forward, Bosch has a huge uh, community behind it. And uh, a company like ourselves, uh, we can possibly influence what we want to see in Bosch, uh, its capabilities going forward. Um, so I think that's, that's very valuable to uh, where we're headed. And uh, another thing that uh, I would encourage uh, is prior to uh, deploying your, your Cloud Foundry solution, is ensuring your IaaS is solid. Um, that's another reason we went with Azure. We knew we wouldn't have to worry about that lower layer uh, of management. We knew uh, using Azure, our, our partnership with Microsoft, we would have a very stable IaaS layer uh, that we could deploy Pivotal Cloud Foundry on and, and deliver value to our customers ASAP. All right, thank you. Any thoughts? So you on your platform team, do you have specialization, or are all your platform engineers generalists as far as knowing storage, compute, Bosch, and all the... So the question was, just going to make sure, yeah. um, do you, does your team have specialists, or are you kind of more generic type uh, team members? So you're talking networking, Bosch, different groups, how do you cycle the team? So uh, I failed to mention we're our, we are in our infancy. We've only had our foundations up and running for about four to five months. Um, so right now, yes, you could say we're generalists. Uh, the few people on my team, uh, we basically have to know all the, all the inner workings, all the pieces. Um, but definitely as we grow and scale, we are going to have to split that up in some way, shape, or form, I feel. Um, but at the same time, I think everybody has to have sort of a, a common level of knowledge across all the various pieces, right? So we can have that conversation back and forth when we uh, plan for new foundations or, or making changes and, and so on and so forth. Um, so that's where we are in terms of that. Okay, so next question is for Michael. Uh, as a developer who, pr who prior to working with Project with Pivotal was a .NET focused developer, uh, can you tell us how your experience has been using Spring Framework? Uh, sure. So, I mean, my previous experience, um, you know, pretty much primarily using ASP.NET MVC. Um, so coming to Spring Framework, um, there are a lot of similarities between them. Um, I mean, Java and C Sharp are, are very similar languages. I do find Java can be a little bit more verbose at times. Um, Part of the learning process for coming into Spring was uh, just learning sort of the Java way of, of beans. Um, but I did really like how it does dependency injection. So the fact that you can just auto wire um, you know, dependencies into the classes, um, I found that was really nice. 
Um, I also really liked the the annotations that it has. So we leverage a lot of the annotations for things like caching, database transactions, and scheduled jobs. Um, there was a little bit of a learning experience there, though. Um, there's some gotchas where, because I guess the way annotations work, creating proxy classes, um, they don't actually work unless you're calling a public method from outside the class. So that was a little bit of a learning experience for us. Um, also, we had a couple challenges with um, dealing with connecting to multiple databases within our app. Um, so typically in spring, if you have a single database connection, um, you sort of sort of you know magically get your, your database source presented to you um, by just binding that through the services. Um, so for us, what we actually had to do was uh, manually parse out the VCAP services. Um, and ha we had to write a little bit of logic to handle being able to connect to different databases within our app. Um, another contrast, I would say, between coming from .NET and ASP.NET MVC to Spring was um, some external integrations we had with SOAP services. Um, so I did find it was a little bit more work getting that set up in Spring as opposed to uh, coming from the .NET world. So and then obviously with your first project with Pivotal, uh, what was your expectations around microservices-based architectures? So we did have, I think, an expectation in coming into the project that we would be actually starting with microservices, so sort of building the app, um, separating out the services from the start. Um, but what ended up actually happening, um, and I think this comes from sort of the, the pivotal way of working where you don't build things until you actually need them and actually know what you need. So we ended up actually not starting with microservices. So we, built, we did build a monolith first, um, and I think there are certain advantages to doing that. Um, you know, early on in the project when you're building these, these services, you know, there's a lot of refactoring that goes on, so it's a lot more efficient to do that refactoring sort of within one app rather than having to do that refactoring across like the HTTP layer as well. Um, but I think we can definitely, you know, when we start looking at our next project um, is when we'll start looking at what that shared functionality is and you know, we'll know more about what exactly we want that to look like and I think that's kind of you know, a better position to actually start separating out that functionality into shared services. Any, any questions for Michael about this? There will be a round of questions about it. Yes, go ahead. What, what did you miss uh, in .NET other than, you know, what you mentioned uh, some of the things there are some other things you mentioned so what, what did you find that was better in Spring? Uh, okay, so the, so the question is what did you miss in .NET and what did you find you know, better in Spring? So in .NET, um, in terms of language features, um, the big one I'd, I would say is Link. So, I mean, Java 8 does have the Stream API, um, but, you know, I, I use Link extensively in .NET, and I do find it is, it is better, um, especially the ability to do Link to SQL. Um, in terms of dealing with, with a database, um, it is a little bit of a different sort of way of thinking. So one of the things that I did like about Spring um, was the fact that we, so we used Fly for our database migrations, um, and I found that that really helped with ensuring that you know any changes you're making to the database aren't going to break anything because those migrations have to work when you're running your tests. Um, so I did I did actually like doing the database the Spring way a little bit more than uh, the old way I used to do in .NET. Other questions? Yeah. What development methodologies do you use? Is it like TDA pairing? So yep. the question was what development methodologies do you use? Is TD and pairing? Yes, so we did TDD and we did pairing. So we were pairing with Pivotal developers. Um, and yeah, so TDD was a, was a new thing for us as well. Um, and I found that that has just enormous benefits. Can you explain in what ways you find it compared to what you used to do? Um, so, I mean, the number one, I would say, is just the amount of bugs that you reduce by doing TDD is, is enormous. I mean, you know, you're spending a little bit more effort up front, but I definitely feel like in the long run, the time you're saving not hunting down bugs um, is well worth it. Um, and it also kind of helps you drive out your design a, a little bit better. So rather than, you know, I find the way we used to work was we, we would try to sort of think at like a large 
piece of functionality level, and we would you know work on building that, and you maybe do some engineering that's not necessarily necessary. Whereas with TDD, you know you look at exactly I need to I need this small piece to work. Okay, write a test for it, and then implement that. So you end up actually building out the design of your code to only really implement like what is actually important. Excellent. Thanks. So, next question. Aisha, you're the product manager for uh, PMT, which stands for Portfolio Management Tool. Um, there is somewhat of a transformational journey that your team, including yourself, had to go through. Can you please describe what this was like? Absolutely. So the beginning of this year, uh, we were asked and challenged to st experiment actually with the Pivotal Labs process as well as the Cloud Foundry process. Now this was an experiment which uh, we were not really allowed to fail and, and we took that as a challenge. Um, one of the things that, that was transformational from, a P uh, from the PMT standpoint, which is one of the very uh, strategic product that the company is investing money into for our front office delivery. Uh, we want to have a one-stop solution for our portfolio managers, which right now are, are operating under a fairly manual, a, a very high operational risk environment. Um, some of the aspects of our transformation journey included people, process, and technology. Uh, the biggest challenge with the people uh, and what we had to transform was around just getting over the mindset that we had. All of us, when before we even started on the product, had a preconceived notion of how we wanted to make it work, and each of, each one of us were opinionated about it. So we had to uh, leave that biases aside, and we had to focus on designing the product based on user needs instead of what we thought is the best. Uh, in terms of processes, as you hear uh, Mike mentioned, we had to educate ourselves on, on TDD. Or we had to educate ourselves on how to do pair programming. We, we tried to be agile, uh, but uh, we were literally stuck in a hybrid motion of being agile, but, but almost a waterfall shop. So this almost helped us get us there. Uh, we also, in terms of technology, had to educate and train ourselves on, on PCF. We had to train ourselves on Java, which was a huge learning curve for a lot of people on the team. Uh, and and that, that resulted in, in, in like some of the uh, transformations that we had to go through overall. Uh, it wasn't a rosy road, uh, but we got there. So, so the question was, Java is tri strictly new language for you? Yes, yeah, so Manulife has been and it still is a, is a fully stacked .NET shop. So Java was a completely new stack that we, have, we were introducing as a part of this. Hey, another question is, uh, are there any insights you could share with us when starting any project with Pivotal? Yes, have faith in the process is, is, is my biggest uh, finding coming out of this, we did enter into the process very resistant, and there's Simon sitting in the audience smiling there. Uh, <laughs> we, we were extremely resistant to some of the processes that, that they were trying to like, you know, preach us, uh, but we, we tried to keep an open mind and it really worked. So you have to be open to the process. One of the other biggest learnings that we came, uh, that, that was uh, internal to us, is when we went into this engagement or, or uh, this experiment, we had multiple goals going in. And some of the goals were conflicting with each other. It was around enablement. Hey, let's experiment with new technologies. Let's come out with an awesome product. Uh, and at times, that resulted in, in, in too much tension within, within the teams because we couldn't give justice to all the goals at the same time. So we had to make tough choices there. So the question is, they heard this morning that culture shift was a very important aspect of this. And can you describe what it was like and what we had to do? Absolutely. So uh, being in, in Loft, we were already uh, one of the goals of the loft is to actually transform the culture for the remainder of the firm so we were carefully chosen to be the advocates of this going forward and one of the biggest things that that is that we had was was top down support so you heard uh, our cio and, and jesse here is sitting in the room where they were they are, they are advocates of like this agility of the culture that they want to bring to the table and now they are going to plant us as seeds into other teams to to bring that forward Either. 
more questions for Risha? Because I have a couple. <laughs> she doesn't know this. Though. So um, let me ask you this question, which is interesting. So PMT is obviously the first application you worked on. And from being from Pivotal, typically we hear, you know, dealing with the business is sometimes a challenge because they're used to doing things a certain way and have certain expectations in the, of IT. So can you explain how you got business on board uh, with PMT? What, you, what was the process like? Sure. So I, I remember my first meeting with the business users and they are like, hey, okay, these are our requirements. Can you come back to us two months later when you are done? The, the good thing about this business user that, that we selected, and again, this was an experiment that we were not allowed to fail, hence we carefully selected some of the products and the partners that we wanted to work with. This particular business user was has had a very bad experience previously in working with IT. He, he was working with a couple of our offshore teams for over six, eight months, and he still didn't have a product at hand, right? So he was already burned on that front, so it was easier for us to get him on board to, to have faith into the process. We tried to do uh, user demos every once or twice a week when, when we had enough to show and, and, and collect feedback based on it. Uh, our users are now huge advocate of the process because now they are seeing the value of continuous delivery. Uh, they, they, they request something and it's there next week which they never expected would ever happen. So the, the last one I have, curiosity. Um, you said top-down support is extremely important. So maybe for each one of you can give us your perspective of what is that what that means to you, like what kind of support did you get and what kind of what did what did that enable you to do? Sure, I can start. So so the biggest uh, it's, it's always good to know when your management is behind you because there were a lot of times when I, I went to teams that were outside of us, right? We had to deal with vendors. We had to deal with uh, legal. We had to deal with risk. Uh, I could go and, and challenge their processes and, and in some cases just make decisions and move on, right? Uh, and knowing that the management was behind that was extremely helpful uh, because there has been times where we were in very tough situations where it, it took us like, 12 weeks to onboard a vendor, right? Which, which really means that we were operating in somewhat of a waterfall fashion until we could get that vendor onboarded. But just knowing and like making tough calls that, okay, if legal isn't doing their job, we'll just do it ourselves, that helped. Yeah, I can definitely add to that from the platform side of things. Um, so like I mentioned, we're using Azure Public Cloud um, and our risk uh, management team gets heavily involved with anything we do uh, on that platform. Um, so knowing that we wanted to deploy PCF on Azure, we had to get them on board ASAP, like from day one when it came to, to, to explaining them to, to them what PCF's all about, how it works. Um, you're not able to, well you are, but you're not, you shouldn't be logging into each server, running scans and so on and so forth. There's different ways of doing that. Um, we weren't going to be using our, our standard Windows uh, gold images that are, are certified, right? You use stem cells. Um, so having that top-down support also from that end of things, they were sort of forced to learn with us, um, um, work around the, the various nuances and, 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 and uh, risks that this type of product brings but then finding ways to, to minimize those risks um, for a, a company such as Manulife. Um, as a developer, I think the biggest hell for me was just you know, giving us the ability to actually fully embrace the process, so not having to you know, compromise um, based on sort of existing practices that we had too much with this. Um, a big part of that was our release management. So we previously had a very sort of restrictive release management process. Um, and, you know, working with Pivotal and the new platform, um, you know, just having the support for us to have the freedom to, to deploy things, um, you know, to be able to actually do continuous deployment, um, you know, getting a little bit of leeway from, from risk was, was very helpful. Um, and also just, you know, listening to the feedback from developers of you know what we find works and what we like so um 
one example is, you know, we used to always use PCs, you know, being .NET shop. Um, and one of the feedbacks that we provided as developers was, you know, we really prefer working on Macs if we're going to be doing Java. And it was like, right away, okay, here you guys go, Macs, no problem. So that, that was great for us. Cool. No, thank you. Uh, anybody else have any questions? I assume that you had kind of an operation team before that property was installed and that uh, this, this operation team was responsible for getting your apps in production, stuff like that. How did you manage to get those people on board? Because you know, usually this is a hard, hard task. So the question is, typically you have the old operations team, we're used to doing things a certain way. How'd you get them on board? You find people like Peter and then make them join the team. <laughs> no, it was almost around that, right? So we had to pick people from every team uh, to, to help embrace that process so that they can like preach their other team members to do the same. And we just really lucked out with Peter on that. Yeah, and uh, like Michael was saying, continuous uh, development, we use Concourse for that, right? Um, so existing layers or existing roles sort of in some way, shape, or form might not be required anymore um, because you do all your checks and balances and tests and so on and so forth in your pipeline through Concourse, right? And then at the same time, it can deploy your application. Um, so in that way, shape, or form right now, certain roles that... Are, exist in, in our as is mode, what we call uh, mode two, is it? I don't know. Um, we don't have them, or, or they might be um, under the same platform. Uh, they might be consolidated within like one group, like platform. So, platform and ops sort of we do the same thing instead of having that separation. So the, the question was, there was a two-phase shift from .NET to Java, and then from you know, coding by yourself to paired programming, and the question about how was that, what was that experience like? I was doing Yeah. You're doing two things at once. Yeah. It's usually um, so I mean, it was, yeah, it was certainly a little bit of a challenge. Um, I would say the, the, the technological shift using a different stack was the easier of the two. Um, I found the bigger shift was in, in the way we work. So, you know, we were, so basically the, the developers on this team, you know, our role is tech lead, right? So we are used to being sort of the leader of a team of, you know, offshore developers. So it was, it was certainly a challenge for us to change our mindset from being, you know, kind of the person who is always sort of making the decisions on their own to, you know, constantly every day pairing with another developer and being like more collaborative in those decisions. Um, and I think in terms of like test, test driven development, um, you know, it takes, you have to sort of, you have to work at it. You have to get that, um, yeah, you have to get that rigor to actually follow the process. Um, and I think, you know, starting pairing with the, with the pivotal developers and then, you know, them being there to enforce that was very helpful in that transition. So the question is, do you s over time, do you see everybody doing paired programming, or is there certain cases where paired programming does not make sense? Yeah. So we are not going to always do pair programming, as far as I'm aware. Um, so what we've kind of found is that there there's certain situations where it's very advantageous, um, but there's other situations where it's a little bit wasteful, we found. So a good example is, you know, if, you, if you're working on some new critical feature of an app, doing pair programming is very advantageous because you get that second person looking and helping making those design decisions. Um, it's also very useful for if you have someone new coming onto the team for that knowledge transfer. Um, we found that the areas where there's not so much of an advantage of pair programming is when you're doing sort of a more like small repetitive task. So if you have, you know, 
you've built out some grid and you, ha and you have 10 columns in the grid and it's like, okay, let's add one more column that's very similar to the rest. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense to pair on that. You can, you know, you're not really sharing a lot of new knowledge or making any real major design decisions doing a task like that. All right. Well, thank you again, Keith for Manual Life. Thank you for attending.